So hi everybody and welcome back to our author interview series. This is another of the author interview series which is connected to the conference My uh, Poor Devil which is 100 years of Georgia Hayer's The Black Moth and this is another of our authors from the Queering Hair author panel. Um, so this is Zen Cho, the author of Sorcerer in the Crown, uh, To the Crown even, um, <laughs> and other works, which she is going to tell you about now and just briefly introduce herself and her work. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, Sam. Um, I have written two uh, fantasies, historical fantasies set in Regency England, that Sorcerer to the Crown and the sequel to The True Queen, um, which I, I tend to describe as Jane Austen with dragons and people of colour, be mostly because not as many people have heard of Georgette Hare, but it's really more Georgette Hare with the people of colour and dragons. Um, I've also written um, a novel called Blackwater Sister, which is a contemporary fantasy set in Malaysia, um, a novella, um, The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water, which is kind of tropical usia, um, a, a kind of fantasy take on emergency Malaya about bandits and nuns and um, hijinks, um, and a short story collection called Spirits Abroad. So um, I've written uh lots of words but perhaps not in a very focused way <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that this so you're of the authors that we've got you're the one that's sort of most mixing together fantasy and regency and history um and i'm wondering sort of where did you come from if that makes sense did you come sort of more from the fantasy side and mix it in or you came from the romance side or you were always working in these two uh, areas simultaneously well, I really like hair. I, I would say that I don't read that much genre romance, um, not because I don't like it, but it just hasn't really been a genre that I've read that much from. Um, but hair is an exception, one of the exceptions. Um, and so I've, I've read a lot of her, um, her regencies. Um, and I think, I, I think, um, in a in a way, um, the kind of historical side is kind of where I came from in terms of mm. uh, as a writer. Because growing up, I grew up in Malaysia, um, and growing up, I read a lot of um, kind of British fiction, um, particularly for some reason, nineteenth century fiction. Actually, I say for some reason, but I actually know the reason why is economic reasons. Um, so basically, my parents would take me to the bookshop like every weekend, and I would only be allowed to buy one book. Um, and um, and books like a, a kind of relatively more expensive in Malaysia than they are here, um, like, you know, relative to cost of living. And basically, uh, I remember there being this series called Penguin Popular Classics, which are these little beige paperbacks, mm -hmm. and they were um, five ringgit 80 cent, which is around a pound um, at, at current conversion rates. Um, and what I always say is J Jane Eyre is a lot of reading for, for a pound, um, you know, and so if you're, uh, you know, an avid reader who's kind of constantly running out of reading material, it's quite, and you're only allowed to go to the bookshop, you're only able to get to the bookshop once a week, that's actually quite good. Um, and I, I think like Penguin Popular Classics for reasons best known to themselves decided that popular classics were largely 19th century novels. So I kind of grew up, you know, and I was fairly young at when I started reading these, like maybe 12. Um, and so, so I kind of grew up on these, these kind of um, 19th century novels. Um, and I see that as kind of being my entry point to fantasy as much as into writing kind of historical fiction, because um, it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of serious in that, you know, you're, if you're a kind of kid growing up in contemporary Malaysia, and you're reading about, you know, these kind of societies kind of fairly alien social norms and they use language very differently and they have this like new technology you know novel technology like horse-drawn carriages and handkerchiefs that you don't use in your ordinary life so in a way you're kind of reading about an alien planet and its customs um and so that that felt quite not you know I read it quite naturally as fantasy um actually and this isn't really a new thing of me um that I'm saying, um, Diana Wynne Jones, the fantasy writer, she wrote an essay once about, I think one of her sons, um, maybe at a similar age that I was when I started encountering these novels, read um, Rudyard Kipling's Kim. And talking to him about it later, he really enjoyed it, but she found out that he basically had, ass had ass assumed, understand, and he basically read it as a fantasy novel. He hadn't clocked that basically, you know, the, the kind of, um, the India that it depicted, um, 
was a historic, you know, kind of a, an actual historical place and setting. He just read it as a fantasy. Of course, you can read it as a fantasy. It kind of does make sense to read it that way um, if you don't have the kind of historical context. So, so I think that's that's that was kind of my in. Mm, that's really that's really fascinating. I'm I'm a little bit curious, and this is a side point for your kind of very um, intriguing kind of overview point. But my side point would be what did you sort of get really into with the 19th century? Because I fell into the 19th century kind of popular classics. For a similar, they, they used to be a pound in England as well. You know, they used to have the words with classics for pound. And that's what I would get when I was younger in the bookshops. And I had this massive collection of <laughs> words with classics. Hmm. Um, and for me, it was like Thomas Hardy. I was a big Thomas Hardy fan, uh, which is quite strange possibly. Um, and um, Lorna Doon, absolutely lovely. I remember Lorna Doon? Such a way, such a, so weird that that was defined as a class. It, well, that wasn't my one of my favorites. I have to say, um, I never really got on, on with Thomas Hardy either. Um, I think like Jude the Obscure is like the only book I've ever like zero starred on Goodreads deliberately because I disliked it so much. But um, uh, I really like Jane Austen. Um, the Brontes, I was keen on all 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 the Brontes. Um, I was, you know, I was really drawn really to, um, I really liked, I guess I really liked uh, the novels that kind of focused on like, you know, um, kind of the female point of view, I guess. And um, I was really interested in kind of social dynamics, or, you know, kind of um, family stuff. So, so, so kind of Austin and Bronte, I really liked. Um, I'm trying to remember the other ones. Um, Kipling actually, I was really keen on. Um, I really, I really liked Kipling. Um, you know, particularly, I guess his um, not necessarily stuff like the Jungle Book, but he wrote he wrote Puck of Pook's Hill um, and a couple of um, associated kind of short story collections, which were um, these short stories that basically had a kind of um, framework that were I think I think that there were these children called I think Dan and Una I think they were their names and they lived in Sussex um, and they come across Puck like the, the character um, and he basically tells them stories of English, like English history and so they're like short stories that then like I don't know it's from the point of view of someone in the like stone age and like point or, of, or like a Roman um, you know soldier living in Britain um, and um, I really I really enjoyed those um, so yeah uh, it's, it's, I, those are kind of off the top of my head. If I if I had my childhood bookcase in front of me, I'd be able to kind of be like, oh yeah, that one and that one. That one I wasn't as keen on, you know. Never really got into that one. Like the the other the ones I never really like George Eliot. I always kind of struggled with because I think she was probably slightly, you know, I I really did kind of read these from kind of between the ages of like twelve and fourteen, and so she was probably slightly above my kind of level at the time. Dickens, for some reason, I was just really into Dickens. I think Dickens is weirdly readable when you're a young person into classics. Whereas George Eliot, I agree, like I never got into George Eliot, really. It still haven't. But definitely as a teen, I tried and just hit a bit of a wall. Just like, yeah, don't get it. <laughs> like, just, like, don't, what, what's she going on about? <laughs> is everyone so sad? I... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But the Dickens, Dickens, like, I mean, he did write popular fiction, right? So they are very, you know, if you can get over the verbosity, which if you are used to Victorian literature, they're like, okay, yeah, that's just part of the, you know, that's just part of the genre. Um, you know, they are very funny books and they're very, they're very, um, you know, good entertainment. Mm-hmm. I, Really, I, I love that idea that you were talking about with the, this world that was so different was essentially fantasy. But how did you come to sort of constructing your fantasy regency world that you have in sort of the Sorcerer's Crown and Tree Queen? Well, so I read a lot of historical fiction growing up. I also read, you know, a decent amount of fantasy as well um, and, and science fiction. And so kind of all, I, I guess all of those things were influences. Um, and I also kind of grew up with lots of kind of just based like um, kind of like supernatural stuff. Like um, I think a belief in the supernatural is much more kind of a default in Malaysia than it is um, in the UK, at least that I've, I've encountered. Um, and so like most of my Malaysian friends and family um, believe in spirits and they believe in ghosts and stuff. Um, so, you know, you're always hearing stories about that kind of thing. Um, and so that that was kind of another element I think that um, kind of went into my work and, and, and indeed or of course Sorcerer to the Crown and the True Queen do draw on, on Malaysian kind of folklore and mythology as well as kind of the 
uh, other more kind of conventional tropes of Western fantasy, um, like fairies and and um, magic and, and so on. Um, with with Sorcerer to the Crown, like, how I kind of came up with it was um, I had been trying to write a novel for a while. So, um, and I just couldn't really make it work. Like I wrote kind of two novel length things that didn't really work as stories. They didn't work as novels. And I was kind of, and, and what where I fell down was structure and plot. I, I just really couldn't get my head around structuring something that long. And then what I said to myself was maybe I should steal the structure of, of, of a kind of genre book that I, I like. So, you know, Georgette Hare, she, she, she tends to write fairly, you know, the, the plots have a formula, you know, and, and they have these kind of sets kind of sequences um, that are very easy to borrow. Um, and of course she has lots of imitators. Um, and so and so I thought, well, what if I what if I borrow the plot or the kind of structure of a Regency romance? Um, and another another source of inspiration actually actually was um, PG Woodhouse, um, whose um, kind of country house comedies I really enjoyed again um, growing up. So um, you know I'll, I'll just sort of take all these favorite books and kind of mash them together and then I also really like dragons and stuff like that so I'll put those in and fairies and magic um so that's kind of how it came about and but the, the kind of the inspiration I guess in, in the motivation for drawing explicitly in Regency romance was in a way to have that plot structure and then and then and then what I did was kind of push at it and see right what's the story I actually want to tell within this structure? And so it obviously ends up quite a different shape from most romance novels, but it does have a kind of strong romance subplot um, in, each, in each book. Yeah, I mean, I one of the things that I really enjoyed about the romance subplots, and this is particular to me, but I've always enjoyed a book where the romance subplot is subtly there. Like you've dropped these little grains in all the way through but it's not kind of the focus of much of the of the plotting. Um, so was that sort of a deliberate choice for you? Is that the kind of romance you like to read or? I don't know that was a deliberate choice, but I think it's it kind of came from the sort of book I wanted to write and that it was a fantasy novel. So it, it needed kind of plot that was separate just from the relationship. But I think it's a real you know I think it's such an interesting thing for you to say because I think it's such a classic thing for her to do I think I really like her books as I've said but I think what actually in a way they're often not that satisfying as romances <laughs> you know um, if you're you know if you're reading for kind of like to feel kind of swoony and be really into the relationship it for a lot of her books just don't do that for me because actually she um, you know, she deals with the kind of central problem of writing a romance novel, which is that you need to kind of be into the characters being together and they need to somehow seem like a good fit. But at the same time, you, she needs to keep them apart for the entirety of the book, like except at the very, very end, they're allowed to get together. So the way she does that is to just like have quite a lot of her books be focused on something else. And the romance is kind of threaded through, uh, you know, as you say, kind of a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there, but actually the main plot will be like, I don't know, my brother's, yeah, my brother's got gaming debts, like, you know, like my, uh, my, you know, my, 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 I have like six cousins, all of whom have kind of really extremely, annoying life problems I need to deal with somehow you know that kind of thing and then and so the romance just gets like fit fit in like around all of that um, which I think is very clever and that's part of the appeal of her books kind of all the hijinks but um so I think as a result sometimes you're kind of like oh I really would have liked to see you know like the main couple like <laughs> just like have a bit more romance I, I mean I, it's just it's me as a reader like I love a surprise romance and it's not really a surprise but I love one that kind of comes out at the end and it's almost mm. a fate complete but when you look back it's been going on the whole time I feel like that's some that's to some extent happens with like Zacharias and Prunella where he's spending so much of his time denying the possibility you know like you've got that keeping apart all the way through <laughs> and then at the end it's kind of like um, no spoilers guys sorry <laughs> yeah I mean having having complained about what hair did did I'm like oh yeah I did exactly the same thing <laughs> but I've, I have an excuse because they're not they're not genre romances <laughs> no and I mean I I really loved it I loved and I love kind of rereading as well and picking out the the moments and the threads and the giveaways and these kind of 
I, I mean, I love those moments which have so much meaning, but they have, there's almost nothing going on in it, but they have so much more meaning because there, there isn't this kind of, all of the emphasis and all of these scenes together and all of this intimacy. Mm. So speaking about Sorcerer to the Crown, um, we found in our book group when we read it that we had a particular favorite character um, and I'd like you to, uh, to ask you about her. I was just checking her name to make sure I got it right, which is Matt Gengang. Mm -hmm. um, and she was fabulous, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I think she was a runaway, the favorite character of everybody in our reading group. Um, and I just wondered, where did she, where did she come from? Uh, what was your inspiration for, for her? And why is she so amazing? Yeah, so, <laughs> why is she so amazing? So Matt Gengang, uh, for people, well, I don't know why, anyone who watched this video if they hadn't read the book but um, um she's so she's a malayan witch and she arrives kind of in the course of the book's proceedings so basically kind of takes over um so she's a supported character but she is um you know she's the type who to go to kind of does steal the scene that she's in um i i write a lot of kind of bossy supernatural asian aunties i think it comes quite naturally to me um and I guess there's a few different reasons. Like firstly, um, quite sort of, uh, what's a good word? Um, very strong-minded <laughs> woman in a senior position <laughs> relative to me have been a feature of my life. Um, I think it's fair to say. So So I, they find their way quite naturally um, into my fiction. Um, and they're always really, like Mangungang was probably the easiest character to write. You know, she always knew what she was going, she wanted to be doing. And she was always very active as well. Um, and so it, she just made her the scenes that I featured her in very easy. Cause she just, would just you know, I just put her on the page and off she would go. Um, she, um, and and she came about kind of putting her in a regency kind of re, like a regency London set novel inspired by regency romances. I guess firstly you've got that tradition in, in hair. You do have these kind of you know strong minded women. Um, I'm trying to think if there are that many older ones. Um, like you know obviously she does have many managing females that are kind of young and the then you know kind of the the female lead. But I don't know how many managing older women she has they often are you know she has quite she has she had, one type is the silly kind of older woman you know mother or, or aunt whatever um she has some kind of quite smart ones but they tend not to be that involved in the the uh if, you know in the events maybe because they would just sort things out too quickly um you know, it's kind of... sort of deus ex machina a little bit. Like my one of my favorite characters is Lady Aurelia in the Unknown Ajax, who just comes in at the end and sorts everybody out in a way. Right, 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 but... right. Yeah, yeah. So she's she's quite, but she's kind of holding back right for the whole yeah. of the book. Um, so if you let her so... run, <laughs> she would be. Yeah, yeah, because I think I think yeah, perhaps because in Harris books, particularly, like uh, the problems are kind of mostly kind of social, like the problems of social kind of etiquette and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, and, and problems that a kind of capable older female with sufficient status perhaps is, is perfectly cap um, well able to resolve. Um, whereas I guess conveniently, Sorcerer to the Crown being a kind of fantasy novel, you had kind of bigger issues that like, you know, just one witch charging around is not going to be able to solve, although she's going to try her best. Um, but actually, uh, so, so there's that tradition definitely in PG Woodhouse, lots of aunts, right? So you've got Aunt, Aunt Dahlia, you've got Aunt Agatha, um, and, um, and, and he, and so Bertie, in the Bertie Wor Worcester books, um, they, you know, he has these very strong-minded aunts. So, so that's, that's, a, that's also uh, a kind of inspiration. Um, but why Gangang is in Sorcerer to the Crown? Um, and I can't remember if I did this Actually, no, I think I did this consciously, actually, looking back. Um, it's been a while since I wrote the book. But um, without, <laughs> without trying to spoil the entire plot, I will try to, you know, I, actually, I don't remember the details that well, so I should be able to avoid spoiling it. But basically, when you read it and then you kind of step back, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the kind of um, machinations happening in England where the book is set amongst the wizards and the, the magicians of England are sparked and they 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 um, kind of revolve around basically the politics of a small Malayan island, um, Jandabaik, which is where Makgangang is from. And she's kind of a, in, engaged in a kind of power struggle with the Sultan there. 
And I think, and I, I brought that in deliberately because um, what I was interested in doing, Source of the Crown, was thinking a little bit about like, uh, the kind of um, colonialism um, and kind of using almost these genres I really enjoyed as a way of, of looking at them or, or kind of thinking about them. Um, so I thought, for example, having two main characters that were people of color would kind of um, in itself kind of show some of the tensions um, in, in this imagined version of the real society, you know, historical society. Because obviously, the ver you know, if, I, if you, you base a book on Georgette Hare's Regency England. That's that's different from actual Regency England. That's like a and particularly and then if you base it on like P.G. Woodhouse's England, that's also a very different. You know, that's those are fictional spaces. Um, and and um, and that that was the whole point. I wanted something quite escapist, but at the same time, um, you know, these escapist worlds are are kind of underpinned by these like um by certain you know imperialist history and, and context, and um, and so. I was really interested in making visible um, what was going on in, in some of these colonial territories. Gender Bayek, as at the time of the book, is not a colonial territory, but it's kind of starting to you know, navigate um, British interest, you know, and, and it's, it's affected by, by the wars in Europe um, in a way that kind of, I guess, um, uh, what's the word, kind of predicts what happens later. So, so British power becomes kind of Britain, um, Britain consolidates its power in the Malay Peninsula later in the 19th century, but it's, it's kind of an early nascent stage at the, in the early 19th century. So so that was, because I guess I'm from, because I'm from Malaysia, so that was kind of something I was really interested in. And that's why Mak Gang Gang is in the, is in the book, um, as, um, because I deliberately kind of structured the plot in a way that, um, said, how do I put this? So basically, I, I growing up, I, I kind of was con I grew increasingly conscious that I am in many ways a kind of product of, of British colonialism. And I think when you're from one of the kind of colonial territories, it's really clear the impact that the empire has on you, but Britain is not conscious of the impact that the empire has had on it in a, in, in a way where it's like, it's, it doesn't recognize really, um, I would say the influence that say the, the other, the cultures of the other countries in the, you know, the countries that they colonize affected them and, and how it shaped um, British society. Um, and I think having gender by be the kind of fulcrum of the plot of Sorcerer to the Crown and having Mak Gang Gang be a prominent character is kind of my way of saying, um, well, we shaped you, um, if, if that makes sense. So that's a really long rambly answer and it, oh. it kind of feels like it gets quite far off the topic, but that that is, that's why she's there. I think that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. Uh, it's a really, it's every answer that you're giving me is going into such a deeper level than I've been thinking about. So that's amazing. Because I was just like, Mak Gang Gang's amazing. <laughs> I love how she just kind of storms in and is like, why isn't everything going my way? <laughs> but I mean, one of the things that you said when you're advertising it, you say it's like it's like Austin or it's like hair with dragons and people of colour. So one of the sort of things that we're thinking about at the, at the conference and in that queering hair panel is about sort of the ways in which writers like you and like KJ and, and Kat and everybody on that panel are widening out sort of that Regency bubble in a sense that what well, is kind of like the hair bubble, this particular creation which normalizes and uh, disseminates a particular version of the Regency. Um, and so obviously you're sort of including that history of colonialism and that impact of uh, sort of both on Britain as well as Britain's impact overseas. Are there sort of other areas of um, the, kind of the regency that you're looking to kind of expand and explore including you know obviously the situation of, of Zacharias and Prunella for example in in England and that sort of the colonial subject in England and how that sort of works but just broadly how are you expanding <laughs> that regency bubble do you think yeah I don't know I don't know what um the other authors motivations are for expanding the the bubble as it were I guess um for me the way the way I approached it was um you know 
<laughs> I have a lot of friends who who when they have a cold will read Georgette Hare, but um, but generally they probably quite like to be reading books that aren't um, you know quite as kind of classist and kind of um, often anti-Semitic and, and 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 so on. I always think Hare is so interesting as well because like when it comes to class particularly, she treats it as something that's really really real, um, and I think that is almost like a fan like a it almost makes them fantasy because you just have to accept the rules of this world in order for the plots to work. And it's, so it's almost like you're saying, you're asserting, look, there's this magic, okay? And if you accept the magic bit, that bit, that's that then explains the entire premise of my plot. So you just have to accept that that initial bit. And it kind of makes me think actually of um, Joe Walton's book, uh, Tooth and Claw. I don't know if you've read that, um, but that's a fantasy which is inspired by Anthony Trollope, I think. Um, but uh, it, basically all the characters are dragons, but it's like it's like a Victorian novel, but they're all dragons. So it's about like, <laughs> I think like in the beginning, like the patriarch dies or something, you know, it's all about like inheritance or whatever. Um, but it, it posits that, for example, these like weird ideas about like female purity are like true. So like if, if like, I, it's been a long time since I read it, so I, I might be rec recounting it slightly inaccurately. But for example, you know, if you're like a virgin female dragon and like a male dragon gets too close to you, that you can literally like change color and then you're tainted forever. Um, which I think is a really interesting way to, you know, to deal with these ideas that are basically fake and made up by society, but like, you know, to kind of give them a kind of reality in a, in a, um, in a fantasy sense. Um, but so <laughs> to kind of get back to your question, um, uh, like my, so, so kind of my way in was, um, you know, Georgia Hare books are really fun. Um, they're the sort of thing that you read when you, you have a cold. But it'd be really nice to have like a version that was like not quite so antiquated in some of its notions. Um, you know, and so maybe a version that had people of color in, like having a good time, or like queer people having like a happy ending. Um, and so, the, so it wasn't like I didn't have to like, um, there wasn't anything too complex in my head when I approached it. it was literally like why don't we take this nice thing and then make it nicer yeah I love that but that sort of expansion it's interesting like that you mentioned class as well because obviously you have sort of more of a range and nuanced kind of version of class going on in the book rather than the kind of you know hair is very blood will out um at times you know, like, ah, we should have always known she was a duchess because she had good manners. Right, right, right. Yeah, she she has a, she has a certain quality. Yeah, yeah. Like, or like, they're known, um, how do you pronounce A-J-A-X? Is it A-X? Ajax? Ajax. Ajax. Yeah. They're known Ajax, um, where, like, I, I would have been, I mean, I would have been into him, like, being really working class. Like, you know, I don't know why he had to go to Harrow or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very sad for me because I mean I'm from just down the road from where Hugo's from <laughs> so I feel I feel very attached to him but I'm also like he's rejecting us <laughs> yeah well he is and like you know when he plays up his Yorkshire accent and is like actually I can talk like a civilized human being and you're like fuck off <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a it's a funny it's a funny one to read as a Yorkshire person I mean I love it because it's one of the, the best kind of convoluted plot ones you know where you have that new one at the end and lady of Rayleigh are being amazing and it's a funny book but it's also like the yorkshire stuff in it is very like okay <laughs> it, it's just yeah um i actually reread it recently primarily because i read an interview with john boyega where he was saying because the, the guy from bridgerton was it was like a group interview with a bunch of people in, in hollywood like mostly black men and um, the guy from bridgerton was in the interview so john boyega was joking or maybe saying seriously that he would quite like to do a G regency movie and i was like yes and i was like who would i cast him <laughs> as in a hair adaptation and obviously it would be hugo in the Un unknown ajax because he would be so good at that you know he like the kind of whole like Oh yeah, I don't know anything. And then actually, um, being very very sharp under it, I think he, I think he'd be fantastic. I bet he could do a Yorkshire accent, like more or less. Uh, I'm always very wary. <laughs> he'd, he'd be better than an American. <laughs> um, accepted. He's very good at accents. So you know, it's interesting that both my conversations today interviews. Obviously, if you're watching at home, they will be watching these on different days. But both the conversations that I had today we ended up fan casting <laughs> stuff. But specifically, the persuasion earlier, the new persuasion. 
Um, but yeah, I could, I could see him. I could see him as Hugo. <laughs> but um, I got distracted by Yorkshireness then for a second. <laughs> the, we haven't really talked about the true queen and because that one obviously um, the focus is a lot more on sort of gender bias. if I said that right? Gender bias, yeah. Bike. And, um, you know, on, well, not to give anything away, <laughs> but characters from um, uh, from gender bias, let's just say, and other associated realms. Um, so how was sort of, was that, a, for you, was this a kind of expansion of the Source of the Crown world? How did you, or why did you decide to, to, to sort of flip the focus in a way on that kind of much more. Um, well, I, I felt in a way that I'd spent enough time in Regency England. <laughs> and yeah. so I was looking at, and I was thinking, well, let's, let's, um, as you say, flip it. Um, so the main character is a young woman called Muna from Gender Bayek, and she doesn't know much her, or, about herself at the beginning of the book. And you don't know much about her, but you know, the kind of secret to her history lies in fairyland. So she eventually has to travel there via England. Um, and so, um, and she's she's under a curse um, that um, threatens to kill her sister. So she she has kind of a you know very strong motivation to to break it, and she needs to go to Fairland to do that. Um, and um, and so uh, that doing that, I I, I did want to um, kind of see the world that we had encountered in Sorcerer's of the Crown, assuming you read Sorcerer's of the Crown first, which I know you you personally didn't. Um, but I wanted to kind of show it from from um, the perspective. Of somebody for whom um, England was not central, um, and um, and it was you know kind of marginal to her, and she she only really goes there through necessity. Um, I also wanted because when I was writing Source of the Crown, I was just kind of throwing everything you know like kind of everything in the kitchen sink, and I was just having a bit of fun, um, and so I thought my conception of Fairyland in particular need a little bit of work um, because I was like, okay, so it's fairyland. It's um, in the book, it's uh, in the world. Um, the world of the book is the source of magic. So human, the human world, we have magic as well, but it all comes from fairyland. It like flows into, it's like a natural resource that flows into our world from fairyland. Um, and I was like, okay, does it only border England? That, you know, that doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. So I was like, that, that it must sort of border every human country, um, because obviously every country has its um, spirits and its kind of, you know, magic. Um, and and so that was part of my motivation to, to kind of show readers that, um, in, you know, the English um, have, you know, their own names and their own kind of um, perspective on fairyland, but other peoples have also, you know, have different names and, and, and kind of different interactions with them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I love the way you, you, you did the summary so much better than me. <laughs> I'm dead trying to fluff around the spoilers, but you're just like straight through. Um, yes, I mean, I really enjoyed that kind of building up of fairyland and particularly the dragons. Um, loved the dragon history there and also I mean obviously Bertie Worcester was a bit of an influence with the dragons right yeah so um so the main career kind of ship in True Queen is is a, an FF ship but um one of the kind of other queer couple that appears um is basically a dragon slash human magician ship well, kind of. <laughs> uh, it's kind of questionable how human the magician is and, and how draconic the dragon is. Um, but, um, and, and there, those characters were fairly, I didn't even really think too hard about it, uh, fairly like um, the dragon is, is based on Bertie Wooster, but also um, Freddy Standen from yes. Capillion. <laughs> um, and in fact, I, I found an early draft in which I called him Freddy, and I remember thinking, I got to change his name. <laughs> it's too similar. <laughs> <laughs> and then um and then the human magician is based on smith um with a p from Ho woodhouse yes yeah okay yes that makes i love that he's actually kind of freddy <laughs> yeah. 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 freddy is my top favorite hair character so oh, i love freddy cotillion's my favorite hair book um, yes same yes. yeah it's so good it, yeah it's just such a it's such a good 
story. I love him. I just fell in love with him when I was younger. That was it for me. He's such a good. He's such a good character. Um, he's just brilliant, and I think like so rare, relatively rare amongst many romance novel protagonists, you know, even novels by Hare. Um, in like just not being a dick at all. He's just a really nice person. It's just yeah. He's just a lovely guy. He's he's sort of sort of the start of the himbo for me yeah right right i can see that yeah 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 i mean yeah. he's very practical and efficient when he needs to be which is a surprise to everybody <laughs> i think that's the thing isn't it he's not intellectual but he is actually very intelligent but it just just yeah. in terms of like i don't know like it's a different kind of intelligence it's not book smarts he's socially intelligent right exactly exactly and that's maybe that maybe that's quite rare to find in books because books tend to be written by people who highly value book smarts yeah yeah i mean I, yeah he was definitely my favorite hero growing up but very unexpectedly because i was you know i valued book smarts and i wanted my book smart heroes and then i met freddie and i was like mm, no <laughs> the, the himbo that's team it. has a, the, the has a fatal man. allure <laughs> Um, well, thank you for chatting to me. I'm going to, I'm rounding up with the, the standard questions for you at the end, but it's been a really lovely chat. Well, thank you. Um, my first question was, uh, and I mean, we've talked about your history reading classics, but what was the book that first got you into, and you could say two if it's, if you want to say two for different, but what was the first book that first got you into sort of Regency romance? And what was the first book that got you into fantasy? So, Regency romance would have been Cotillion. That was actually the first hair that I read. Um, well, I guess maybe arguably Jane Austen was the first entry point, though I don't really think of her books as, you know, Regency romance as such. Um, yeah, so having just named a hair novel, I'm going to pull back and say actually probably the earlier entry point was Jane Austen. And like, it would have been, I guess, Pride and Prejudice, I think it's the most romancy of her novels. Um, and then fantasy, um, it's, I feel, I feel like there's kind of a split between, um, you know, the children's books that you read and nobody really thinks of them as their gateway to fantasy, like Narnia or whatever. Everyone's just like, oh yeah, you read Narnia because it's a, their children's book. You know, they, they, they don't think of, but they obviously are fantasy. Um, and, and particularly, um, I've always drawn a lot of inspiration from, um, female fantasists like Edith Nesbitt and Diana Wynne Jones. But I think, um, in terms of you know the kind of adult novels that were were I guess the entry point for me to fantasy. Um, it I mean this is such a cliche answer, but Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was was really a big kind of big moment for me <laughs> when I read that, um, and probably did set my tastes. Um, but then I've never I've never really liked any other epic fantasy quite as much as I like Tol Tolkien. I'm I'm actually not a big epic fantasy fan, so. Maybe that's a fake answer. No, I mean, it's interesting because Tolkien was my kind of first like real deep dive and I've read some other epic fantasy, but not as much. I feel like I never quite got past Tolkien, mm. Mm. Um, weirdly. Um, <laughs> but um, so the second question is three authors um, and you can be specific as you like as to works as well that have you think have either sort of inspired you or influenced you in some way in your writing career or continue to do so? So it can be three recommendations, if you like. Um, so Perry Pratchett was a really big influence because um, before him, I'd been reading um, kind of P.G. Woodhouse and I, I was really into Jerome K. Jerome as well, Three Men in a Boat, you know, going back to the Victorian um, and I, I really enjoyed these kind of comedic books, but Pratchett's Discworld series is really the first time I read books which had that kind of very, sometimes very broad humor um, and just was constantly kind of making jokes. But at the same time was clearly, the books were clearly serious as well and dealing with quite big ideas. Um, and you were meant to take the characters seriously, you know, as, as people, um, whether they were human beings or not. Um, and so that really kind of showed you know, that really made me think, oh, I didn't know you're allowed to do that. Like, write books are like serious, but also funny. Um, so that was really um, influential. Um, and then it's, it's hard to kind of pick out individual authors, isn't it? Um, I will name um, Naomi Novik, um, who wrote the Temeraire series. So I guess also has that kind of foot in, in um, 
Regency set fantasy. Um, I would say she inspires me more. Like I really, I really like her books. I really love her books, but um, she inspires me as much. I think for her kind of attitude to her career. Like I, um, like we know each other from from way back when, and um, I've always kind of admired like how she always like just chases her joy when it comes to um, creative kind of. Um, work um, and it's something I try to to bear in mind and kind of do myself and then I think the third one will be trying to pick from like a range of all it's, it's just like so many you know you kind of think oh I took a bit from there and took a bit um I'll say Karen Lord who again is a friend um but again I really love her work and I think it really exemplifies the kind of drawing from um different um kind of disparate sources of inspiration so including maybe you know your own culture that is perhaps underrepresented in kind of what's uh, anglophone literature but then also like um you know these really cla these classics of kind of anglophone literature and just kind of coming up with something um that just feels really fresh and exciting but then also really classic at the same time excellent that's really cool um uh, so the third question, as you know, and you might want to change the parameters for it, was is usually three sort of films or uh, TV series or sort of audiovisual media broadly understood um, that you would recommend that gives us a bit of an insight into your sort of tastes and likes. Um, I'm all good actually. Since because you mentioned that you're going to ask this before the start of the interview, I've had enough. I think my subconscious has worked on it and come up with an answer. Um, because my my initial um, response was, oh, I don't really watch much TV. Um, but uh, so audiovisual um, things are kind of given an insight into my taste. So as I said, Lord of the Rings was really influential to me. Um, for me, um, the book, but also the movies. Um, so. I don't even know what's the point of recommending Lord of the Rings. I kind of feel like if you if you like them, you've watched you have watched them already. But it, it kind of it fulfills the bit of the question, which is like if you want to know what what kind of shaped my taste and, and kind of um, get an get an idea. Um, so that, but then also um, I, I had like an anime manga phase. Um, so I'll recommend the anime um, Honey and Clover. Um, which is a um, really great um, series. It's kind of slice of life and it's about these friends who are at art school. And it's literally just about their like their lives, you know, their romances, um, their kind of artistic, their creative aspirations, you know, what they're trying to, the work they're trying to make. Um, and I watched it when I was at a similar age as the characters I was at university. And it really, you know, it really stuck with me um, because it had this very, um, you know, kind of really pure hearted kind of um, engagement with the idea of, of making art, but then also building relationships and also kind of conscious a kind of awareness of that kind of how fleeting that period of your life is um, and how important those connections are. Um, and then and then I had a third one, which I've, I've not forgotten. <laughs> Having talked about Honey and Clover, because I was just like, oh, Honey and Clover is so good. Maybe I should rewatch it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna just stop it too because I, I, yeah. I definitely had a third title, but I forgot it. Oh. That's fine. Thank you very much for the two, um, and thank you very much for joining us. It's been really, really uh, lovely to have the conversation with you. And obviously, everybody watching at home, um, if you haven't already, um, you can find out more about the conference and the panel, Queering Hair, with all of our authors. That will be below this video. Um, <laughs> you can find out more about that there, but also uh, go and check out and his work as well um, and hope that you enjoy i'm sure you will um so thank you very much um and goodbye <laughs>